Hello everyone, it's Dan King here with the Better Mental Health video cast series brought to you by Fireside. So here at Fireside, we acquire and invest in group mental health practices with the goal of creating a better mental health industry for everyone, including therapists, practice owners, and clients. And our listeners and interviewees are therapists, especially practice owners, who have to make important decisions about what makes for great therapy, great therapists, and great business. So these are some of the questions that we explore together. And I'm really pleased today to be joined by Kristen Genzano at Kristen Genzano Therapy. Kristen, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. It's so awesome to be here with you. So Kristen, I'm curious, just to start from the beginning, about what brought you to therapy as a career choice? Mm, such a good question. Um, I think if you ask some people in my life, they would say I was just born a therapist. So there was no, <laughs> no, no real questions asked from the beginning. But um, I had kind of a windy path getting to this point. I um, actually studied psychology in undergrad and then went into um, working for professional sports teams. So I worked for a couple of NBA teams for a handful of years. I worked in corporate contributions industry for a handful of years. And then I went to started grad school for um, actually public policy and nonprofit management. I was at um, NYU Wagner's Graduate School of Public Policy. And in that process, I took the Myers-Briggs and I was like, oh, I'm an INFJ. What am I doing here? I need to be one on one with people and did one of the hardest things I've had to do, which was leave an amazing program and pivot to go to grad school to become a counselor. So it was a windy road, but I definitely, once I landed at um, my graduate program at Northwestern, I felt like I was totally in the right place and on the path to doing this work in the way that I was meant to do it. Interesting. Okay. If you were to put your nub then, if you were to put a fine point on what was it that didn't feel right about the other path, mm. what, what was it? That's a great question. So I think... Hmm. I think at the time, I knew I wanted to make an impact, like, especially when I was in corporate contributions. And when I was starting down that path of like public policy and nonprofit management, I just knew I wanted to have an impact on the world. And I think what started to become clearer for me is that I was just really most comfortable and most skilled at doing that one-on-one -on -one, at really being present with people individually mm. as compared to trying to come in and sort of run things even though that's also a skill set that i've like developed over time especially as a group practice owner but um in terms of that point in my life i was really kind of feeling into my ability to be present with people and to hold space for people and so i think it was maybe more a matter of recognizing that's what felt best rather than being with what felt wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's powerful that you noticed this one-on-one -on -one dimension felt so right to you. Mm -hmm. Because there aren't that many domains where one-on-one -on -one connection is so vitally important. Sometimes, mm -hmm. especially when we think about making a big impact, one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. can feel a little small, right? But there's a whole world. You know, I, I speak as an only child, right? And so many of my closest connections are one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in a fast-moving world, we can kind of ignore one-on-one. -on -one. It feels slower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think that was a little bit of what I was sort of um, – bumping up against or grappling with earlier on in my career is that feeling of like, but if I want to have this impact, it has to be big. It has to be this, this, you know, have this huge reach and yeah, just starting to realize that these individual touches and these individual connections do have incredible reach. Yes. We just don't see it always, you know, we don't see how far it goes. So transitioning then to a group practice, it's one thing to choose to be a therapist. It's another to choose a group practice. So tell me about the genesis of that. Yeah. Um, well, I think probably like a lot of group practice owners, I really 
kind of stumbled into it at first. Like my very first hire was, it was sort of like, well, I have this long wait list and I have this um, person who's interested in, in working with me as a supervisor and, you know, a newer clinician. And so it was just sort of like, okay, well, maybe I just grow this into a group practice. Um, that was kind of like the very first step in. That said, I had also had a couple of experiences at group practices where I, they weren't the experiences I would have wanted. They weren't, they weren't experiences that I wanted at all in terms of being an employee at a group practice. And so I sort of hit this crossroads of stumbling into someone interested in working with me and having this past experience of being like, you know, I don't know if you ever kind of like imagine, oh, if I were to ever do that, I would do it differently. That's kind of where I was coming from when I was in the other group practices. I was like, oh, if I were to ever run my own group practice, I would do it differently. And so then this crossroads comes where this person is ready to interested in working for me. And I'm like, all right, here's my chance to do it differently. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. And so what does doing it differently look like? Yeah, well, so for me, it has been really a practice of um, trying to keep the therapist, like my employees, um, at the center of the practice. So really, one of the first things I think about is compensation, like really wanting to compensate my team as well as I can, which is hard to do, actually harder than than I think most new practice owners expect. Um because there are a lot of expenses that we don't realize, you know, are, are necessary in running a practice. But that always stays kind of center to me is that um, I know from my experience working for someone else that being a therapist is a lot of work and it's a lot of deep work. And we tend to undervalue that in our society and also in our field. And so it's really important to me to try to make sure my team is compensated well and also like, the sort of non-monetary compensation. So making sure they're taking time off, making sure their caseload numbers aren't too high. These are things that I wished would have been done for me in some of those earlier experiences at other practices. Yeah, there are a lot of expenses. There's no question. And if we find ourselves kind of either accidentally or, or you know, very few people prepare us for what it's like to really run a growing business. And I'm curious if you could speak to, maybe just from a mindset or emotional perspective, what that transition was like. Hmm. Gosh. Um, well, I think that I did a lot of just sort of learning as I, like I still am doing a lot of learning as I go. And so there, I think from a mindset perspective, it's kind of shifting into this um, Mm, fluidity, fluidity, flexibility, adaptability, like this kind of space of like, I think one expectation I had, oh, this is my practice. So I'm going to sort of have control over the way things go. And I'm going to be able to understand what's going to happen next. And what I've, I've really learned is like, no, this might, this, my mindset has to be like, I have no idea what's coming next. And I have to be sort of open and receptive to whatever that might be. People have a lot of agency, and the more people that work for us, the more stakeholders are impacted by our business, the more I find business owners in any domain, whether therapists or not, if they end up doing it for a while, and if the business really grows, humility tends to set in at some point. Yes, real, I mean, beautifully said, absolutely. And for me, I think it was pretty quick. <laughs> It had to be. Yeah. <laughs> what makes then, so given that part of the motivation was, well, I was in these group practices, they weren't exactly culturally what I would have preferred. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you spoke about paying therapists more, but I'd be curious if you could speak to a broader vision of culture beyond just paying therapists more. What kind of mm. culture is it important for you to create? Mm -hmm. That's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, well, I think it, I think for me, there's a lot of, um, emphasis on valuing ourselves 
And so um, when I think about the culture I'm trying to create at my practice, I'm trying to create one where we're in integrity with ourselves, where we are honest with one another, even through difficult conversations. You know, we can do that. It's a skill that most therapists can do with clients, but it's not always easy to translate into our personal lives or our professional lives. And so that's something that we really try to emphasize, at least I try to emphasize in the culture at my practice. Um, I would also say mm, self care, although I'm sort of like that word is so is used so often. And I and it's sort of I always have this question of like, what do people even mean when they say self care? Yeah. Um, so I think it's respecting ourselves and also um, taking ownership and responsibility for our actions, that these are ways that we can also sort of care for ourselves. And so that's something we try to really stress in our culture. So interesting. When we think self-care, we think about health, we think about meditation. Integrity isn't the first thing that comes up, but mm -hmm. I, lo I think you're absolutely bang on. That in, I mean, what, what, one of the ways I think that that's shown up for me, you know, there's this really interesting idea that you want to watch yourself when you speak. And as mm. therapists, right, you're in a situation where you're speaking, you're in conversation and connection all the time. So when in conversational connection, and you just watch yourself, you know, I don't think you can watch yourself and just assess your level of integrity in the moment. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important practice and you mm -hmm. can feel strong when you say the challenging thing that might be tough, but truthful. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my experience is of really focusing on this area. Your health absolutely improves if you take this on as a practice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And I think what you're describing is connected to another piece that we were speaking about earlier with that sort of, we didn't use the phrase slowing down, but when I think about that kind of moment in my career where I decided to go working with individuals versus, you know, large groups or organizations, part of that was a slowing down. And I think what you're describing requires that we slow down and pause and just take our time to check in with ourselves, to be in integrity so that we can, we be like you're saying, being in that space means that we are automatically taking better care of ourselves. And the world can demand that we speed up or at least we can feel the pressure to do so. Whether it actually demands that we do is a separate question, right? Yes, that without a doubt it's our perception. It's the, it's definitely kind of the, the pressure that we can feel whether it's really there or not. Yes. Um, and as I think about sort of the business, so I think about both culture and sort of business model and how that works in therapy. Like if we can't slow down in this industry, where can we slow down? Right? Like there's almost an opportunity I feel in an age, and I'm just going to state sort of my opinion, um, mm -hmm. so much, unfortunately, some elements of the industry, and I'm just going to say better help and talk space, um, I think move us in a direction of, of the perception of speed, right? And hustle and grind. And, you know, the grind gets celebrated. And this isn't to say that you shouldn't work hard at something you're passionate about. Um, but I think in the hustle and the grind, so much is lost and particularly in a setting that should be less transactional and more relational, a setting that should be more about truth, integrity, connection. Um, the faster we are, the more we ignore those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, part of the, mm, I don't know if, power is the word that's coming to mind. I'm not sure that's exactly what I want to say, but part of the, the, the power the impact of being in a sort of a therapeutic relationship is that it is this space where you have, hopefully in a traditional therapeutic relationship, you know, you have 
the same person every week or every other week where it's just this hour and it's yours and you sort of know it's there. And so you can trust that that time is sort of suspended for you and that that person is, is present with you in a way that you don't get anywhere else. And that is a very different experience than kind of um, on-demand therapy. Mm. And I, I want to be really like, I just want to sort of name I, that there are also different needs for different levels of access and privilege. And I think that there are important benefits that come from accessibility and all kinds of things. So I want to just really recognize that. And I want to hold that this kind of more traditional therapeutic space has a special and a certain kind of benefit that other spaces don't hold. To experience that specialness um, requires a shift in consciousness. And I think, I guess what I'm seeing is how much you are valuing culture in part for that reason. You know, that the mm -hmm. kind of culture that you want to build can create that shift in consciousness or at least facilitate it and be, be a part of it. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for recognizing that. That is absolutely my, my aim. That's my direction for sure. Yeah. And so how do you reconcile that with, do you have a desire to grow the practice further or is that not, you know, do you sort of want to keep it as it is? Like, mm. how do you relate that to the question of growth? Of the mm. Such a good question. In fact, it was one I was like mulling over in my mind this morning as I was most good, you know, thoughts come in the shower. So as I was in the shower, I'm mulling this over like growth versus where we're at right now. Um, and, you know, so right now I have three therapists and a practice manager and myself. So we're a team of five. Um, and I do, I do think, so I, I'm actually pretty clear that I do want to grow the practice and what, like how I kind of reconcile it is that I think I need to grow it slowly even though there's enough demand for me to just hire several more people right now. Um, but to stay in my own integrity, I need to grow it slowly. And I need to make sure that the folks that join the practice are the right therapists, the therapists who are in a position where they're not only excellent clinicians. I mean, that's that part, I feel like we can, there are a lot of really good clinicians out there but folks who are in a position where they're ready to step into their own value and really like do the work of caring for themselves first. Um, and yeah, not everybody's ready to do that. How do you check like in an interview process? How do you assess that? Yeah, I'm still, so that's one of those things, still figuring it out. I've definitely, learned a lot as I've brought folks on um, over the couple of years or the last couple of years, especially during COVID. Um, so a lot of it for me, to be quite honest, is uh, intuitive. It's just kind of a gut feeling that I get when people are across from me. And then there's questions I ask around like, you know, what are the ways you take care of yourself right now? What, what are, what are the caseload numbers you're used to and what do you want? Where do you want to be? Um, and why do you want to be at that number? Because um, that's a big piece is the why. It's like if the why is because, you know, I feel most fulfilled when I'm seeing six people a day, five days a week. Okay, great. If the why is because I need that, you know, sort of amount of money to, to sustain myself, that's a totally legit reason. Yeah. And that's just an indicator of where that person is at, which isn't right or wrong. specific kind of culture that you want to create. Exactly. And that is, I feel like, at least for now, a very much a work in progress. And on, on this question of fit, uh, so are, there, are your therapists part-time, full-time, a mixture of? 
I had a feeling you might ask that question. Um, so I hesitate to answer because I think one of the things I'm really um, wanting to challenge is the the notion of what a part-time therapist is and what a full-time therapist is. Um, I think traditionally, and you know, if you look at kind of even like in my um, uh, like Gusto, the 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 um, payroll company that I work with, it's like you have to work 35 hours a week to be full time. But does that mean you have to see 32 clients a week? And I just I'm not interested in defining that as full time. So from my perspective, um, at least two of my therapists, actually all at least two of them are full time at my practice. But numbers wise, I'm not going to kind of like, I think we need to change that ideal idea. I love that challenge. Super interesting. Yeah, to have just such a firmly defined idea of this is when you're full time, this is when you're part time. And there's often a stigma that comes with part time, right? Mm -hmm. There's kind of this idea that you're committed to something, it means you're full time. Um, I think there's some judgment implicit in that that might not be mm -hmm. warranted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the only reason I kind of put that third person in that part time space is because that person has. Uh, their own separate private practice that they run. And so I think they would, they would sort of hold that I'm part here and part there. So super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, lo I love that challenge. I love that. <laughs> um, so as we come towards the end of our time together, I'm curious, maybe to ask a few more questions. You know, as you think about this conversation, the direction of the industry, the kind of group practice that you want to build, do any other comments sort of bubble to the surface? Anything else that you think is worth us discussing? Mm. Well, I think what, one question that sort of comes up for me in this space is just like, I think because I have such a, a vision of where I want my practice to go, I, I think the question that comes up is like, do other owners want this too? Or are, are other group practice owners kind of just wanting to um, do more of what's already been done? And, you know, obviously I don't think you or I have the answer to that, but that's definitely a, a question that bubbles up for me, this kind of philosophical piece. Curious to learn more if you, you feel you have this really clear idea of the vision. You know, we've talked about slow growth, we've talked slower growth, we've talked about culture. Are there any other elements of the vision that maybe we should flesh out that, that we can make? Mm, 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 yeah. Um, not, I mean, not really. Those are the two that I think are the primary pillars for me. Mm hmm. Yeah. Anything relating to type of therapy, specializations of any kind, any kind of service that either perhaps you don't offer or would like to offer more of? Anything else mm. come up on that wavelength? Yeah, so um, sure. I think that, well, I don't know if this is exactly what you're kind of opening up to, but I think. Um, one of the things that I think a lot about is this kind of idea of like having my practice specialize or sort of target to a certain audience versus having there be more um, um, I guess kind of like you know more sort of generalist kind of practice and that's something I've I've just sort of grappled with a lot over the last couple of years and in part because um, there's this tension that I feel between wanting to serve like diverse populations and then also wanting to recognize that um, we can't be everyone to everybody. We can't be everything to everybody. And so because, um, because equity is one of our core values at my practice and inclusion is with that. There's this real tension around like, who do we serve? Why do we serve? Who do we market to? Because that's part of who we serve. And why do we 
why are we marketing to those people? Is that because we want to just sort of check a box of diversity, equity, inclusion, or is that because we are really deeply trained in this space and can hold that for folks who need that? Um, so that's an area I can get really kind of excited and interested in exploring. Yeah. yeah. We, so I know I have in the past with coaching practice and I, I know many others have, they feel the pressure to specialize, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always important before you rush to like check the marketing 101 box that you ask some of these questions. And I think it varies from person to person. I know for me, I would feel out of integrity if business were the sole rationale for making a choice like that. Mm -hmm. Now there are mm -hmm. business realities and there are certain advantages to specializing, but can't be the only thing that at least if it were me that's that can't be the only thing and I'm pretty sure for most therapists right they would feel out of integrity if that were the only consideration mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yes in either direction right in either specializing or generalizing because there's mm -hmm. you know there's a, so so I think this is an area that um when you either choose to become a group practice owner or you fall into it you're sort of like all of a sudden grappling with well, how do I, how do I navigate this decision between these two directions and, and why am I choosing this one over that? And again, no right or wrong. It's that right being in integrity and being clear on the why. Yeah, I hadn't considered, you're right, that it could apply to being a generalist too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things in contrast to virtually any other kind of services business that I can think of, we're in a strange moment hasn't always been this way, where there's just so much demand for therapy. There is so much demand for mental health help that you can break that sort of one-on-one -on -one rule in a way that you can't in other businesses. Mm -hmm. So the option is there. And maybe that's a good thing in giving people mm -hmm. that variety and that, that sense of possibility. The option is there and it often isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In yes, ways. that's yeah. absolutely such a good insight, uh -huh. especially like you say in this particular moment. Kristen, I think we've raised some incredible questions here. Uh, so I want to I wanna kind of come full circle with you and end on, on a lighter note because we've talked about some, de some deep questions when you're not doing the important work of being a group practice owner and therapist and supervisor of therapists. What do you do for fun? Oh, such a thank you for asking that because that's even really core to the way I think about my work. Um, well, I have a dog that is sitting right there right now, always by my side. So we go to the dog park a lot, a lot of outside time, hiking, walking, these kinds of things. Um, and I spend a lot of time reading for pleasure. I love reading fiction. It's just like a, such a great kind of, um, I was almost going to say escape, but I actually don't think it's an escape. I think it's a way I feel more and kind of connect with humanity. So, um, yeah, a lot of reading, a lot of just time outside whenever I can get it. I love the sun. Anytime I can be in the sun, I'm the happiest I can be. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So good to be outside for as much as we can. Yes. Right. yes. Last very quick question. I'm just curious, what, what are you reading right now? Oh, I just finished reading... Um, Stephen King's The Long Walk. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's not light. It is very intense, um, as you might guess with a Stephen King book. But um, yeah. yeah, that's I just finished it just the other day. Okay. I don't know what's next. We'll see. We shall. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Really, really enjoyed this unbelievably rich conversation. And, and I'm sure mm. that we will too. Mm, thank you so much, Dan. I appreciate you and what you're doing and, and your time here together, too.